reminded me of my wife's, one of my wife's favorite scriptures. That goes like this.
and whom they might teach the language and the literature of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed for them a daily provision from the king's delicacies and of the wine which he drank, and three years of training for them, so that at the end of that time they might serve before the king. Now among those of the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. To them the chief of the eunuchs gave names. He gave Daniel the name Belshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. Now Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now God had brought Daniel into the favor and goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king. He appointed for your food and drink. Why should he see your faces looking worse than the young men who are your age? Then you would endanger my head before the king. He would be <laughs> if these men didn't look as good as the rest. Now Daniel, knowing how the world system works, couldn't get by with the boss, so he went into the second in command. It says here, so Daniel said to the steward of the chief of the eunuchs, Please test your servant for ten days, and give them vegetables to eat and water to drink, and then let our appearance be examined before you, and the appearance of the young men who eat the portion of the king's delicacies, and do as you see fit. So he consented with them on this matter and tested them in ten days. Now I bet the steward was awfully happy to go along with that. Because where did the food go that was supposed to go to these four boys? It went to his table. So he lived on the high hog for a little while, drank all the wine for a little while, but then ten days were up. And at the end of ten days, their features appeared better and fatter in flesh than all the young men who ate the portion of the king's delicacies. Thus the steward took away their portion of delicacies and the wine that they were to drink and gave them vegetables. Can you imagine Daniel standing here and over here Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and their jaw must have dropped like this, and their eyes must have gone so big. You don't want to eat from the king's table, but he's got barbecue roots. <laughs> he's got bacon cheeseburgers. He's got barbecue pork chops. He's got oysters Rockefeller. <laughs> and you want us to have vegetables and water? Imagine how those young guys felt. They're all their teens. Teens are bottomless pits. We all know that. I was a teen years and years and years ago. I know what it's like. How come Daniel was the spokesman? Today it's Father's Day. And there's a lot of men who never have children. But they're gifted as fathers. I was at a celebration uh, a couple of years ago. There was a, a gospel group that was uh, did a lot of singing back in the 60s. And they were getting together and they were uh, having a bit of a reunion. And one of the young fellows, no, no, one of the young fellows stood up and said, when we were singing, so-and-so acted like a father in our group, even though he was the same age we were. Because he seemed to just keep us on track. He just seemed to see us when we're sort of going off base a little bit. When we were sort of acting a little bit wild, he sort of drew us back to where we should be. And you know, there are men like that. That may not have children of their own, but they certainly demonstrate fatherhood in the way that 
that they're able to interact with people around them. We take a look at Daniel. He's saying this to the, the steward. And he's saying, for the next three years, just vegetables and water. And the steward just rubbing his hands. If you talk to doctors, and you discuss diets, what will they say about lots of wine, lots of fatty foods, lots of barbecue, lots of all these things? Will they say it's good for you? What do you think, Sarah? No. Would you stay as slim as you are if you ate all that? Well, right now you do. But. <laughs> A couple of years from now, <laughs> doctors will say it will be evident in your face. You won't have the right complexion. It will be evident in your mind. You won't have the same thinking process. You won't have the same vim and energy if you take all these fatty things and all this wine into your system. Was there any reward? for these boys going to just vegetables and water. Well, if you've got your app open, just go down to verses 17 and 20. As for these four young men, God gave them knowledge and skill in all literature and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Now at the end of the days, when the king had said that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. And then the king interviewed them, and among them all, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore, they served before the king. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding about which the king examined them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers who were in his realm. Sometimes it works out. We sacrifice, we do what the Lord wants us to do, and it seems to pay off. Sometimes it doesn't seem to pay off right away. It took three years before it paid off for those boys. We usually want things right away, don't we? They had two tables set before them. They had a table of all the king's delicacies. Then they had a table of what they had instructed from childhood. So we eat from a table that has been sacrificed to a foreign god, or do I eat what the Lord Take a look a little farther down in your map. Go down to chapter 3. Verses 16 to 18. To me, this is the greatest statement of faith in the Bible. Some of you may think Hebrews, some other passages. But to me, this is the utmost one to demonstrate what faith is. The king had set up this great statue. He said, when the music starts, I want all of you to bow down to the statue. And if you don't, you'll be thrown into a fiery furnace. The music started. Everybody bowed down. Except three Jewish boys. Daniel, he was off in another part of the territory. He must have been, because it doesn't mention him. Well, of course, all those who have been displaced by these three boys, they ran to the king and said, Oh, king, look at that. He's not bowing down. Those other two, they're not bowing down. You better do something about that. Well, the king liked the boys, and he didn't want to really throw them in the furnace, so he gave them a second chance. He said, Now, we're going to do this again. Now, when the music starts, all you have to do is just bow down. Everything will be fine. And you know what the boys said to the king? He said, Our 
God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us from your hand O king and here is the clinch but if not let it be known that we do not serve your gods nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. How many of us would be willing to say that in the face of adversity? To say, my God will take care of me. I know he will. But if not, I will still trust in him. How many are willing to say that of the person. There were two tables in front of them. One table was the table to honor the king. The other table was to honor God. They chose the table to honor God. And we are always in the presence of two tables throughout our whole life. There's a story of David. Remember when David was just a young boy? He was the youngest of the family. They made him go take care of the sheep. One day, the uh, Israelites were at war with the, the Philistines. And the father said, David, I want you to go find your brothers, take them some bread and cheese, make sure that they're being fed, and then come back and tell me what's going on. So David went off searching for his brothers, searching for the front line. After a day or two, he found them. And he found his brothers, and he was sharing the bread and the cheese. And suddenly, he heard this voice. Israelites, send me your champion. If he can defeat me, we will be your servants. If I defeat you, you will be my slaves. And he stood there on the battlefield. A giant, Goliath, daring the Israelites to send someone out. David looked at his brothers and said, How long has this been going on? They said, For a couple of days now. David said, Well, why doesn't somebody go out and kill him? brother said, he is too big to fight. David rubbed a couple of stones in his pocket and said, he's too big to miss. <laughs> he went down to the river. Oh, before that, Saul said, if you want to go and fight him, come on in, I'll put my armor on you. Now, my brother is retired from the RCMP. He's 6'6", six, six, he's about 260. Big boy, and I have a picture of his little girl when she was about four, dressed up in his uniform. <laughs> now, the leather boots were like hip waders, the tunic, the sleeves were dragging to the ground, the steps was right down over her eyes, and I can just imagine David dressed in Saul's armor. And David said, how could I ever go on and try to battle a dress like this? He laughed me to death. So he took everything off. He went down to the stream, picked up five nice, flat, smooth rocks. Now why did he pick up five rocks? You've got a hand up. What's the answer? for the four brothers 
who most likely come running across the battlefield to get David. But it just so happened they weren't there. David had two tables set before him that day. He had a table of fear or a table of faith. And he chose a table of faith. And it slew Goliath. Now, when we're young Christians, we're full of beans. We want to go out and evangelize the whole world. I remember Pastor Spencer saying that when he became a believer, the first thing he did was go and get all of his family members and tell them all that they were going to hell. <laughs> well, that's not really the way to start things off when you're trying to evangelize. David, when he was younger, was full of faith and chose the right table. But when David got a little bit older, like our age, things weren't quite so black and white anymore. And it turned out that one evening, in the cool of the evening, the sun was going down. He was up on the rooftop and he's wandering around and he's looking out over the city, just thinking what a fine city this is. And I'm the king. And as he wandered, he looked down over the wall, and there was another house. And on the rooftop, there was a little bit of a trellis around, but you could see through it quite easily. And here is a, a woman having a bath up on the rooftop, because it was so much cooler that time of the day. Now, it's not the first look that gets you into trouble, guys. It's the second and the third and the fourth one. An example of that, it was a number of years ago now, I was looking for a new compound miter saw to use out here in my, my shop. And I was searching the internet, and I knew that there was a company called King Tools that makes great tools in a made in Canada, they stand up for now, men, consider what happens when you type in King Tools <laughs> on the internet. <laughs> Can you imagine what came up on my screen? <laughs> well, I got hold of that. I walked down the hallway to Pastor Spencer's office. I said, get out your date planner. So I got out his date planner. I said, I want you to write down on today's date, Pastor George got into war. <laughs> so he wrote that down. Why did you want me to do that? I said, for one thing, I want to be accountable to you that I won't do this again. But also, if someone from the church ever went through my computer and found that there was a porn site and they came to you and said, what's Pastor George up to? You can turn back the pages and say, yes, he did. On this date, he confessed it. And this is what happened. It's not the first look. That's the sin. It's the second third and the fiftieth. David looked over the wall. He saw the first look, but then he kept looking. Then he called the other guys over and said, you take a look. Tell me, who is that? It's a coincidence that she was taking a bath and her name is Bathsheba. <laughs> they said, she's Bathsheba. She's uh, Uriah the Hittite's wife. He is one of your commanders in the military. <clears throat> My golly, she's nice looking. Send someone over and bring her to me. So off the went, got her back to see David. She didn't have too much say in the matter because he was a kid. And he lay with her that night, had sex with her. She became pregnant. David thought, how am I going to get out of this? So 
we call Uriah back from the front lines, Uriah was there being a faithful soldier trying to do what the king wanted. Came back to the palace. David said, you've been working hard. I want you to go home. Lay with your wife. Don't you hate it when people are so good? Uriah said, no, I can't do that. All my men are in the field. I will sleep here at your doorstep to guard you. David said, no. <laughs> I want you to go home and have sex with your wife. I could never do that, King. I honor you too much. And he laid down on this one. David had to do something, so he planned a scheme to have Uriah murder. David had two tables before him, a table of his desire and a table of God's desire. And he chose the table of his desire. Moving a little bit farther on in the New Testament now, we have two men, one by the name of Peter, by the name of Judas. They had two tables set before them. Peter had a table of faith or fear. David stood up to a giant. Peter gave in to a maid. Judas had two tables before him. table of betrayal or a table of devotion. And we know what he chose. Now before Peter betrayed the Lord, Jesus knew all of them. In fact, it says here in Scripture, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And this is a part of the grace of God. Because he also says, and when you have returned to me, strengthen. Jesus to be talking to you, George, and said, Satan has asked for you, George. He's going to set everything he's got to make you fail. But I pray for you. I pray that you won't fall. But after you do, return to can you imagine what it's like for Satan to pinpoint you? Satan knows your name. He knows your desires. He knows how you're going to respond to so many things. And you know, he will make it sound so beautiful, so wonderful. If I just do this, life is going to be so much better. You see my wife in the morning? Look at my neighbor. Look at Bathsheba. Look at the gold that's over here. It wouldn't matter if I just took a little. Two tables set before them. When Satan tempts us, he makes it appear so glamorous, but once you yield, <laughs> What happens? How many of you have ever been on a diet? How many of you have ever decided to have that last piece of chocolate cake? And afterwards you say, why did I eat that? What do you think Satan does? He says, oh, come on. This chocolate cake you're craving for. Look at that creamy frosting. There's only one piece. Go ahead. And as soon as you eat it, you say, 
boy, what a dwarf you are. You couldn't even withstand one little piece of cake. And he sort of drives you down. There goes the rest of your diet out the window. First look is in the center. To be tempted is to sin. But when you look at the table, it's set before you. You have the table of God's will, and you have the table of your will. You may think, why would I want to sacrifice all these different things? Why would I want to work hard for the Lord? There's many other people that can do it. Pastor Ernie, years ago, mentioned in one of his sermons that back in the early 50s, a man by the name of Jim Elliott was in seminary and was called to missionary duty. And his heart led him to South America, down in a place where the Aka Indians were, and they're known to be very vicious. Jim had a saying that is quite appropriate for what he went through, but something for us to think about as well. He said, no man is a fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. No man is a fool to give up what he cannot keep in order to gain And down here we got all sorts of young people. Two tables. What's your future going to look like? How much are you going to turn over to God? But my parents want me to get this degree. That's fine. My parents want me to be successful in business. That's fine. slugging like those four young men eating vegetables and drinking water before you were to start to see something. Maybe you'll be like Jim Elliott. You'll study hard. You'll devote yourself to Bible school, to seminary, only to be snuffed out at the start of your ministry. When Jim Elliott was killed, Pastor Ernie said there was an upswell through North America and hundreds and hundreds of young people dedicated their lives to the Lord entered seminary to go and be missionaries around the world and through Jim's death. So many more people were touched by God's word than Jim Elliott could ever have done. He chose the table of God's word. What table do we serve today? Someone once said, a way to tell is to look at your checkbook. Well, people don't have checkbooks anymore. I do part of the dinosaur. <laughs> but they say, look at their state, their bank statement at the end of the month. And you'll soon see where their heart and their treasure lies. You might say, but I've worked hard for that money. God says, well, I gave you oxygen to breathe to be able to be there. But I should be able to have the right to spend it the way I want. But I'm the one that gave you the strength to go to earn it. But I need all this stuff. And God said, yes, but I've got children who don't have a roof over them. Which will you choose? Sometimes we don't want to choose God's table. Sometimes
times it's the table when he says, here is my brother. And you're saying, but you don't understand, I hate that person. God said, no. Here's my table of love and forgiveness. Not that table. You know, the opposite of love is not hate. The opposite of love is indifference. And the Lord has those two tables laid out before him. Well, I love the Lord my God with all my heart, mind, and soul, and my neighbor as myself. Or will I choose my will? You're going to be leaving here in a few moments. You're going to be faced with two tables, even before you stand up. You know your lives. You know the tables you've been eating from in the past, in this past week, perhaps this morning. And you know of your unwise decisions. Always remember. Satan condemns, God convicts. If he convicts you that you have been taken from that wrong pity, he will draw you to the right thing. Whereas if you've been eating on the wrong pity, Satan will condemn you right down to your socks and say, what a failure you are. We all know the, the gospel verse, John 3, 16. What does it say? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish of that everlasting life. Now 3, 17. For God sent his son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world through him God says to you this morning, I know what table you have been eating. I do not condemn you. I invite you to come back. Come back to my table. To eat from the things that I will provide for you. You have life. the praise team to come this time. I'm going to ask them to sing through this praise song themselves the first time. And I want you to look at the words and meditate on what they say. And then Sharon will tell us when we should <coughs> to join them.
Speaking with condemnation. 